going to start when I was about 12 years old, and I, I wanted a rifle, a, 12, a little 22 uh, rifle, and I guess I saw them in a Sears catalog. Anyway, Dad and Mom finally broke down and bought me a little rifle. And I started shooting anything that would, would move. And later on, I took to, uh, to the woods with the rifle and began on the squirrels. And I had an old black dog, Caesar, and he was good at tree and a squirrel, but he could never catch one. Because when a squirrel starts to run, he runs for a tree, but he never goes up the tree from the direction he's running because something will jump and pull him down. So he'll run around to the back side of the tree and go up. Well, old Caesar learned that. So when he got to the tree with a squirrel just ahead of him, he never stopped at the tree. He'd round to the back, and sometimes he'd pull the squirrel down. If he didn't, then I'd use the rifle. And we just about decimated the squirrels in the, in the local timber. And I feel bad about it now. I didn't then, because I'd bring the squirrels home and dress them out, and that's what we had for supper. But, but I still enjoyed shooting, whether it was target practice or what. And I could knock a sparrow out of the top of a big, tall tree almost every time. Well, later on, the war started, and I was still, I was married at that time. Still had the little 22 rifle. And finally, I uh, ended up in the Army and was doing basic training down in, uh, uh, Arkansas, Fort Robinson, Arkansas. And there was a kid there, I was probably 21 by that time. And this kid was from Kentucky, he was 18. But he, he wasn't a, he wasn't a nice kid. He was kind of a bit of a bully and a loud mouth. Anyway, he thought he was from Kentucky where all the sharpshooters came from. So it actually finally boiled down to kind of uh, a contest between he and me. We were the two top in the company. So finally ended up, and I don't remember how they did the points, but let's just say I ended up with 230 points, and he ended up with about 228. I beat him out, and he didn't like that at all. Anyway, uh, I got a a, uh, because I was in the infantry, got this little badge. Everybody in the infantry wore one of these. But you'll notice there's a, an oak cluster around that. And that means there were three, three grades of, of uh, ex expert, sharpshooter, well, and the other grade you just didn't know how to qualify. But uh, because of my ability, I finally won the oak leaves as an expert. If I'd have been in probably World War I, I might have qualified as a sniper. I wouldn't like that. I don't mind shooting at somebody who's trying to shoot at me, but to just take advantage of somebody who's not, not aware you're there and your, your sights are trained on him, I wouldn't want to do that. Anyway, ended up in Italy, in the infantry, in the 91st Division, and the war was beginning to wind down, but it was a long way from over. And uh, so I, I got a little ribbon here, which was the campaign ribbon for the European Theater of War. And you'll notice there's two stars on it, two little stars. Each star mean that you took part in a major battle campaign. And a major battle campaign might last several months, but it usually occupied as a signal movement, either victory or, or defeat, but, but that kind of ended that, that uh, battle in that sector. And so one of these is, is for the taking part of the, in the Apennine, the, um, Northern Apennine Mountains, and that's where I first went as a, as an infantryman. But right quick, 
uh, they put me into a mortar squad. Uh, I, I, do you know what a mortar is? It's a trench mortar. Yeah. It, it's a it's a tube that shoots a shell up in the air and down. Mm -hmm. And if you're good, after a couple of trial shots, you can pretty well place where that shell is going to land. And I was there you know, in that mortar squad for, well, from uh, probably early February to the, the middle of March. Our squad was, was staying in a cave, and out in front of the cave was a, was a, little, a little flat, almost like a little uh, island. Uh, green grass, right? but that time the grass was beginning to green up. So we're a uh, nine man squad. We was out there in the sunshine because the Germans were over on the other side of the mountain and they couldn't see us. But they had been there before they got pushed out and they knew where the cave was. And one afternoon we were lolling around in the sunshine and we heard this whistle and a shell landed just on the edge of this little green. Well, every man died for the cave, and one, one guy tripped and just at the mouth of the cave. Nobody pulled him on him. We, we just ran over and we had to get to safety. <laughs> one, one of the amusing things that happened, and there's plenty of them that happened that way. Anyway, um, one day we were called out to repair roads because uh, trucks back and forth and back and forth in the springtime rains and it was mud, deep mud, but I had a headache. I was feeling pretty rotten. So finally I told the sergeant in, in charge, I said, you know, I, I'm not feeling good. I'm sick. He said, well, go lay down on that big old rock slab there and rest a while. So I did that until finally uh, the squad went back to their barracks. And I went to the, um, oh, uh, a field hospital, I guess. That's what they called it. And I was there a couple of days. They gave me aspirin and stuff. I said, oh, you're okay to go back to the front. So I went back. But then I got sicker. And read. What precipitated the whole thing was <clears throat> our squad was called out to go up to take over, <clears throat> take over uh, a machine gun outpost up on top of a mountain. And I was feeling bad again. This was about a week after that first bout with the fever. But you can't say, well, I don't want to go or I'm afraid I'm, I'm feeling not very good. They'd say, yeah, yeah, you coward. <laughs> well, so I went. And we hiked up about, seemed like about two miles, almost all the way up, and took over this machine gun emplacement for the night while the local guys who manned the machine gun went on a night patrol. Okay, so <clears throat> long about two o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting on the edge of the machine gun emplacement, all quiet. And suddenly a machine, German machine pistol rattled off just, just below us. I could have, I could have thrown a, a stone in and hit somebody. But we didn't want to give away, and we knew they were searching for the machine gun. We didn't want to give that away. So we all just sat tight. And finally I could hear German voices whispering to one another. They were that close. And finally they withdrew because they, they, they knew their position had been given away. Well, I, I was so sick in my stomach. I'm sure fear was part of it, but the part of it was, was a real illness. So we finally got down to, the, to our uh, bivouac, uh, probably along about four in the morning, and I was sick. Uh, and so we slept for a couple hours, and I went to our, our, the sergeant in charge of our squad, and I said, you know, I'm just not feeling good. I'm sick. 
And he looked at the white of my eyes, and he said, is your urine yellow? And I said, yeah, it's, it sure is. He said, you got yellow jaundice. And so they sent me back to battalion aid station. And I was there a couple of days, and then they got on, we got on two or three or four of us, I don't remember how many, got on an airplane and flew clear back to Leghorn. And I, I was in the a hospital, a field hospital in Leghorn, Italy, for uh, five weeks. And during that time, there was, I think there was 21 of us guys in that ward. And at the end of our stay, we were, we were up on our feet and moving around by that time, and the push for the Poe Valley started. And trucks came in carrying ambulance of carrying wounded and dead corpses. Uh, so it was a nasty, nasty thing going through the minefields before you got to the Po River. And so they loaded us up in the trucks, then they just unloaded the, the corpses. And 24 hours later, we were back at the front. And this time the mortar squad had been uh, I don't know. I never saw any more of it, my old friend. But uh, they put us in a in an infantry platoon, platoon, and we were ready to cross the Po. But the bridges were out, and the Po was in flood at that time. So how are we going to get across? Well. They found some old Italian who had owned who owned a boat, and so about five men at a time or six would load in that boat, and he'd row us across, land us, row us back, and of course immediately we were in enemy territory. And as soon as we had enough men, we started off. I think we're Highway 99, uh, trying to make contact with the retreating Germans. They, well, they, they had been retreating across the Po Valley for, I suppose, three or four days, but they had sown the whole valley with mine, land mines, so with tripwire. So if you stepped on a tripwire, the mine exploded, blew off a leg or whatever. And the guy who was my best friend, Harry Yuska, uh, was carried off the field blind from a mine, and they, they thought he was dead, but later on he joined the outfit again. What happened, the guy in front of him was stepped on a mine, and the mine blew sand in Harry's eyes and blinded him. He thought he'd be blind the rest of his life, but a few days later he just cleared up. So we got across and started out. This may sound like bragging, but I wasn't bragging. I'm not bragging. Because they had to, we reformed the first platoon which was wiped out in the minefields. We were all new. And they needed somebody to, to head up the different squads and the platoon. So the sergeants and the first lieutenant were trying to find guys to fill in. And they came down to me would I be first scout? Well, the first scout in, in a line of march, he's out there in the very front. And I didn't want that. Because the orders were go until you, you meet resistance. But had to go. So finally I said, well, okay, I'd be first scout if another guy who I, I, I had quite a lot of confidence in, and he was from Kentucky. An older man who had been wounded in the, in the ankle by a machine gun oh, several months earlier, but he'd come back. And I said, well, okay, if Pop Riley will be second scout, I'll be first scout. So there we are, starting down the highway. On a, and, and I wrote about that in one of the poems that I, you, you, you probably read the story or read the poem. So there we went. And, of course, we, we uh, made contact. And, except for God's intervention, I wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here today. 
for sure. And you guys, none of you would be here today. Because you're all born after I came back. Yeah, just ruts and limbs. We were going down, entered into a little town, but oh, a quarter of a mile back, we heard dogs barking at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's unusual. And got a little bit closer to town, and the, ch the church steeple started ringing a bell. And that's unusual. We knew it was signals for, for, to somebody, but we had to keep going. And it was kind of a, a town with just, just one main street. And at the end of the main street, on the left side, was the church. On the right side, another road took off. And we came around the corner where, to the, well, standing in the middle of the road, were uh, one, two, three, I think it was five German soldiers. And, but they'd been give, giving up all along. They knew the war was over. But it's kind of like a, a rattlesnake when you cut his head off. He'll still snap and bite you. And these German soldiers were dangerous. Well, we yelled for them to surrender. But that time, a sergeant and a lieutenant and a couple others had pulled up beside me. And one of the sergeants, who'd been around a while, he yelled at him to surrender. He didn't move. And then suddenly one of them turned and ran for the ditch. And the lieutenant just up and one shot from his little carbine. And the soldiers just rolled like a, a rabbit. But then another one picked up uh, his rat pistol and sprayed us. There were probably well, at least six or seven of us in in the intersection, but the sergeant standing right next to me finally got, he got a bullet in the head, or in the, in the leg. But we thought, in, at the moment, you, you don't have time to think much, but we knew that this, this crossroad was, was uh, That they had it sighted in from, from the north, from the east, from the church bell, because often they put snipers up in the, in the belfry. And the best thing we could do was get out of this intersection, which we did. And we lost nobody. Somebody started yelling for uh, the many, because the sergeant, sergeant, what was his name? Sergeant somebody from Iowa. And uh, so they carried him off, but nobody else was hurt. And I don't know how we could escape, because that machine pistol fires, I think, about 3,000 3, rounds a minute. Of course, the magazine won't hold that much, but it's a terribly rapid fire. And he just sprayed us. How we did get, I, I don't know. But anyway, that was, that was the end of it. We backed up and, and came around through a little field behind the stores, the shops. And the other three or four soldiers were gone. So that was the end of that. But uh, anyway, that's the, the Po Valley campaign. We crossed the Po. We were probably, oh, I'd say 30, 40 miles away from the Po. And eventually, after about uh, four days, um, our, our tanks caught up with it. I think they must have crossed the Po on Bailey Bridges. The engineer did a good job. So from then on, we were following tanks or riding on the tanks. The Germans were retreating so fast that there, there wasn't much of a, of a uh, resistance put up at all. One evening, we pulled into a little, a little orchard I, I guess we were all just bone tired, and we were going to spend the night there, I guess. And on one side of this little uh, clearing out in front of the orchard was a little open shed. And nobody thought to go and look in that shed. But two German soldiers had, had a small cannon in there, and our tanks came up. And suddenly, one tank stopped right in the line of fire. And suddenly there was an awful boom. 
in a direct shot, direct hit, and that tank burst into flames. And the, the, the tank driver and the gunner and a well, I think they were a four-man crew, and they all boiled out, blood streaming, but they, they, they didn't they get killed. Amazing, you know. And then something else that I guess I should, I should mention. I think it was the day after that. And we kind of been paired up, the buddy system, you know. And I was buddied up with a, a, a short, kind of a squat Mexican from Arizona or New Mexico. I, I never did like the guy. He wasn't a brave man, as I found out later. But another night, we were bivouacked in a in a little wooded area. But there were Germans around, so we were told. So every man dug a trench, a little slip trench, and crouched down in it for about three or four hours of sleep. And I had done a, an hour duty. Then Sorrel was going to do an hour, and then me back another hour. Every hour he changed with your buddy. So. When it was his turn, and I dropped off to sleep immediately, I was dead tired. And suddenly, a, a burst of machine, a, a fire from the, the the sergeant Tommy gun, and I jerked awake so fast, and I remember saying, "Sorrow, sorrow." I said, "You asleep?" "No, I'm awake." He'd been asleep. I know he had. He didn't hear a thing. Anyway, that was sorrow. So the next day on the tanks, uh, we were going on probably at a, at, a, at a fast pace. And here come a German soldier along the road. He'd given up, you know, hands on his head. He'd had enough war. He came past our tank and sorrow spit on him. And I, I reprimanded sorrow. That German soldier was twice the man that Sorrel was. And he was defeated. He's a brave man. You don't just spit on brave <laughs> opponents, you know. But he did. So, a couple of days after that, suddenly the war was over. And I was alive. There have been times I kind of doubted would I make it. But then, I guess that's always in a soldier's thoughts. I don't know. I, that's that's enough war stories. How was it then that you you celebrated the end of the war? Uh, weren't you in the in the barn of an Italian lady? And well, I sent you something. okay. So that would have been probably two months later, maybe. Yeah. And we had, after the war was over, we weren't that far from from the pole, maybe 30, 40, 50 miles, I don't know. But when they were moved up to the Gorizia area, and that's the last big town before you get into Yugoslavia. So we were in this Italian um, farmstead, and there was, a, there was a barn, and it had a trap door, and there was a ladder leading up to the trap door. And I was upstairs for writing a letter to my dear wife. I don't know what I was doing. It was the middle of the afternoon. And suddenly somebody said, the mail truck's here. So I was getting ready to go down and see if I got a letter. She wrote every day, she said. I didn't get them every day, but most every day. Every day, but Saturday, because no mail went out on Sunday. <laughs> well, anyway, suddenly a soldier stuck his head up to the trap door. <laughs> He was my best friend, Harry Yuska, the one that was carried off, with blinded. The one that you thought was dead, right? Yep. And he was alive. <laughs> I, was, I was so glad to see Harry. Actually, he, he came from a town of Tama up here in Iowa, and later, years later, uh, went up and fed and had it on his farm, his dad's farm. But you do, uh, you, you you lose friendships. And um, another kind of interesting thing happened. But didn't, didn't Grandma send you some soups or something? What? Didn't Grandma send you some soups? 
Number three. On the mail truck. Food. Food. Oh, she does. Yeah, yeah I did. did. Every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Did the Italian lady give you some of her twigs so you could make the soup? No. Uh, she, what, uh, one of the things Ruth had sent was a little packet of dried Lipton soup. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we decided kind of a, a celebration. Our squad was all right there. And we decided to have a little, a little party. And I had contributed the soup, and somebody else contributed that and the other. And uh, the Italian lady, was, she was, we asked her to heat the soup, heat, make the soup with the lip and packet. And, you know, wood is pretty scarce over there. And here she and her daughter, who was probably 14, they broke up enough little sticks to heat the water to pour the soup in. Just enough sticks to bring the the, uh, the soup to a bo- well, not a boil, but hot enough to drink. Then the fire was out, and we insisted that they they join us. They wouldn't do that, but they tasted the soup. Uh, and I can remember her. Yes, my old bueno, bueno, good, <laughs> you know. So, so you started this story with with. Caesar, right? Caesar. Your old dog Caesar. Now I end up with how 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 did uh, how were you received when you got home from the war? Well I don't remember when the war was over, General Livesey when the European war was over, General Livesey uh, agreed to send the 91st Division of Infantry to the Far East to help defeat Japan. And we won our war. And we were at a big parade ground down in uh, Naples. And when he announced that, you uh, you should have heard the roars of disapproval and moans from, uh, well, the whole division, which was 3,000 men. But our equipment was all loaded on board. We were supposed to go the next day. And then the atomic bomb was dropped, the first one. And so they delayed our boarding a day. Then the second one was dropped, and the war was over. So so what are you going to do with it? You already got, I don't know how many divisions of soldiers and troops in the European theater. Our equipment was all loaded. They just sent us home. So whether, we, once we got home, we got a, a two-week extension, a two-week furlough, and then a one-week extension, which made three weeks. And I don't remember if it was that time or later, I was in August, I was discharged on the 15th of November down in Alabama. Whichever one it was, I asked, I phoned Ivan, with his brother, and asked him to meet me at the Burlington bus depot, I guess, which he did, and let me out at the road. Cause I said I want to surprise Ruth. She didn't know it was coming, but old Caesar was still there. And when he saw a shadowy figure coming across the lawn, he went berserk, and he was barking and growling and putting all kind of terrorists into whoever it was. And just before, he didn't get close enough to bite. I even stomped at him a couple of times, and he retreated fast. He hadn't a clue who I was until I said, Caesar. He knew my voice, and suddenly he almost leaped at me in joy, groaned and barked and tore in circles, all of the same, just because he so thrilled that his old master came home. Yeah. Of course, Ruth was glad I came home too. But <laughs> she, she wouldn't run in circles at all. She, she couldn't, I I couldn't shut her loose. <laughs> I don't know if she'd been home since her I, I volunteered because my brother, Russell, was uh, lost his life in, in uh, a plane crash in uh, the island of Sardinia. 
And I kind of felt it was my duty to, to take up where he left off. So that's the picture of then, and you've already seen enough pictures of me now. <laughs> I'm 91. And there's my dear wife at 92. And that had to have been a real sacrifice to your country well, to leave a wife and two kids. There's a sacrifice. Uh, for your country, but it was necessary. So, Grandma, what was it like? What was it like um, holding down uh, holding down a house and two newborn sons while uh, Granddad was away at the war? Well, it was terrible because I got homesick all the time. If you've never been homesick, you can't explain it. It is terrible. So I moved from Windows folks to my folks from my folks to my brothers and family every other week, and that would help me. But um, it was marvelous when he got home, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> Start this section we by saying that I knew Ruth when I was maybe, oh, 12, 10, 12, but I didn't know her well, and then got into high school in 1937, uh, and she was one year ahead of me in school, and but I had a girlfriend part of the time, and I never paid her any attention until I was a junior, she was a senior, and suddenly she took my eye. <laughs> now. <laughs> so he, I haven't even told him this, but I sat a row over from, from him, and he sat up in front, and that. Assembly Hall, and once in a while I'd have to look up, happen to, and he'd be turned around and he'd wink at me. I didn't know what winking meant, so I just kind of smiled and looked like I was studying. <laughs> and then it was the last day of school, and Daniel was in the National Tournament, Iowa. And, this is such a district tournament. Pardon? District tournament. Okay. Basketball. And he asked me to go with him. Well, so the teacher had to drive my first cousin, Bob Wagner's, um, pick up a uh, no, coop. Little for coop, a coop. A coop. So he took he, the teacher drove Bob's girlfriend and me down to the game. And then two nights. The next night, a couple of fellows in the typing room said to me, how about taking, we'll take you to the game tonight. I said, no, thank you. Why not? I have a way. How, with your sisters? <laughs> I said, I have a way. And sure enough, after basketball practice, Wendell dashed upstairs, and there I was, and he asked me to go again. And we all went together from then on. <laughs> oh, I mean... Shereen and Bob and you and I. So we dated about a year and a half, I guess, before we married. Yeah, about two years, yeah. Forty. Maybe, maybe we were a bit young, I don't know, but uh, the war was on with so many uncertain things, and we knew one another well enough, and we were in love, and so we got married. Yep. <laughs> and when you went on those dates? I worked at... Um, the telephone office. Yeah. When you went on those dates, your your dad, Corliss, yeah. he would give you how much money? Um, he just gave in the car with gas in it. Yeah? And one dollar. And one dollar. And what would you do with that one dollar? Oh, no, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, I, I, by that time, I was working full-time with dad in the apple business. Yeah. And on the farm. No wages, no salary. But cause we were just, you do, you did that with your family and for your family. So if I had a date, uh, I'd ask if I could have borrow the car, <laughs> and he would usually give me a dollar, and we would uh, uh, about uh, uh, 
The two of us could go to, could go to the uh, movies for 80 cents, and then we took the other 20 cents down and bought a pint of ice cream at the dairy bar and two spoons, and we had a little, that was our, our, our date. Mm -hmm. Eight out of the same thing. <laughs> Be, really, on the cheap. <laughs> yeah. But we didn't say anything up to us. It was a big thing. And what what was the story behind the table? Oh. oh. In manual training. Well, I, I, that was his last year, and he had made a table, like to put in your kitchen, and a cedar chest, and something else. To the chef and the table and uh, I don't remember anything else. There is something else right now. It's the gone. The table's still down in the basement. Yeah. And I had taken Marie down to school where I worked, and the principal said, "Ruth, I've got something to show you. Come on." So I went clear down in the basement with him. He said, "I've got to show you this. Here's a cedar chest." But here's a table that's been made, and I'm sure your knees will be under that table. <laughs> and I don't, didn't know what to say. I just kind of looked embarrassed and blushed. Looked at it. I bet you blushed. And, <laughs> and I don't think I said a word. <laughs> <laughs> but he was right. So that was uh, the truth. That uh, was a kitchen we had in our table. Mm -hmm. Our table we had in our kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, we used it for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then moved into this old, uh, an old farmhouse, which was right here. And we lived there uh, until 19, from 40, 42 Two. until 51. Two. Nine years were in that old house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No electricity, yeah. no running water. Yeah. But I was happy that way. I never thought of it any other way. And then we have a, got our other house built. And then you, you tore down the first house, right? And yeah, then you, it was over 100 years old. And then This house is right on where the old one was. And then tell us where you uh, lived while you were building this house. <laughs> well, uh, I, I had purchased, uh, I guess you call it a, a small chicken house, a brooder house, mm. uh, that had been used as a dog kennel in Mount Pleasant and hauled it home. And we cleaned it up and, and that's where the boys stayed. And Ruth and I lived in, in the old woodshed out behind. About ready to fall down. <laughs> yeah. But by that time, we did have electricity. Yeah, we did by that time. Because mm. we moved a, a, an electric stove out there. Yeah. And. Uh, no. We, yeah, we, oh yeah, we I did. don't remember now. We, uh, yeah. But the kids would be cold when they'd go off to school in the morning. Mm -hmm. with no heat. Mm -hmm. And we started and over there. So we'd heat the oven up in the old woodshed and they'd come warm up. <laughs> we tore the old house down in July. And uh, actually the three-man crew of carpenters were working pretty fast and they had us enclosed about the time the nights began to get pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, we moved in because it was getting cold. We moved into the basement, set up a couple of beds down there. Yeah. And you, what did you do? Did you cook still out in that old shed? No. Somehow we cooked in the basement on some, I don't We know. might have had moved back in, in the new kitchen, but the rest of the house wasn't finished. I don't remember. I don't know either. So tell me again, we were talking about uh, vehicles and your experience with vehicles um, and how did you get around? You are saying you used what? Well, the war started in December 7th of 1941 and uh, I was a senior in high school and of course gasoline was rationed, but farmers had all, all they needed for farming, had to have. So most farmers only had one tank, and they used farming gasoline for, for vehicles. 
but you couldn't buy any more. Any, only cars on the market were old, old cars. So we we didn't have a car when we got married. We used my dad's car some and Ruth's car some. My dad, yeah. And finally, <laughs> I found this old Model A Ford. After you got back from the war? Oh, well, before. Before? Oh, yeah. I don't remember that. I didn't part. go into the service until June of 1944. Uh -huh. And this was in 41. We were married in 42. Okay. So, two years of. I don't remember when I bought the old Model A. But before that, maybe 42 sometime. And <clears throat> that summer, um, I ran a case bailer for my uncle Orn, because his boy, who he and his dad had the case bailer, but Alice got drafted, <laughs> and so Orn asked me if I would run the bailer that summer. So it was myself and twins from Middletown, McNeil, Keith, and Kenneth, and uh, so it was a three-man crew. One tied wires, I I poked wires, and one of the twin twins, can't remember which did which. One drove the tractor. Pat Kelly was on that crew, so there must have been four of us. At least some of the time there were four of us. And I drove the old Model A to wherever. How old were you when you got the Model A? When what? How old were you when you bought the Model A? I, I don't know for sure, probably, oh, 22 or 23. And how much did you pay for it? $35. $35? Wow. Um, what about, tell me about how you, uh, your experience with traveling via boat as compared to commercial airplanes. So, <laughs> for instance, uh, how did you, when you went off to war, Granda, uh, you, you were sent on a boat. Correct? Well, from, yeah, from uh, Newport News, Virginia, yeah. Yeah. Troop ship. The troop ship. And how long did that take, and where, where, did, it, where did it land you off at? We landed at Naples, Italy. And how long did it take? Probably seven days, eight days maybe. Eight days to cross the Atlantic? Uh, well, no, because when you, when you go past Gibraltar, Gibraltar, then you got the Mediterranean, the whole length of the Mediterranean. Right, right. And there were submarines out too. Right. Not as many, but we had to have a convoy, I guess. Right. Protection anyway. Right. Because the troop ship, I'm guessing we had several thousand men on it. Right. What about your, uh, what about your experience? Uh, you took a boat to Ireland, right? Uh, yes. And what what year was that that you went to Ireland for the first time? What about it? What when when did when when what year did you go to Ireland for the first time? Nineteen sixty two, was it? Nathan was a year and a half old. Uh, fifty. Let me let me back up. Uh, we're at the Bible school. Fifty seven. Nathan was born in sixty one. 62, must have been 63, okay. April of 63. And then how did you get to Ireland? SS America. The SS America, where did you board at? New York Harbor. New York, and where did you uh, offload? Oh, Cove. Cove? C-O-B-H, they pronounce it Cove. Okay. So, Cove Ireland. Okay. And Nathan had chicken pox. Nathan had chicken pox? Broke out on the ship. Yeah. <clears throat> So we scattered chicken pox germs all the way from Cove Island up to Avoca. Uh -huh. uh, well, we didn't really because we missed the train and there wouldn't be another train until the next day, I guess. Yeah. And some young guy came along and he said, I'll take you wherever you want to go. And I said, how much? And he figured a minute and he said, well, such and such. 
He said, it's about the same as a train ticket. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's go. Mm -hmm. So some of our trunks and stuff were freighted into Dublin, and yeah, Dublin, and we piled what we could on in the trunk of this guy's car, and he'd take off, and we made it to a local manor in the evening yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. What about uh, what about airplanes? When did you first start? taking airplanes for travel. We came home from Ireland, the first tour, first, uh, we've been there four and a half years. Okay. And we flew home. Was that your first time flying commercially? Oh, it was, that. yeah. Flying mm -hmm. as for, for travel like that? Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And about that time, they, they took the SS America out of service. Okay. And the reason we went by ship, we could have flown, but, <clears throat> Your baggage amount was limited on in by air, and by ship, you could, I suppose you could have a half a ton of luggage. Yeah. And we had quite a bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause we were moving. All you know. bedding, pillows, everything. We just. That started. was a big reason why I decided to go by ship. Right. Yeah. And how long did that take to go from New York to Cove? Oh, yes. probably six days, I yeah. think. Uh, it was gonna take six days, and it was rough. A rough? All the waves came way up to the top of the boat. We were up a story or two high, and they came and shut our windows because of it was terrible. Portholes. And being sick, <laughs> I couldn't eat anything. Yeah. Yeah. So it then you got to a, uh, and then you got to a Voca Manor that night, and yeah. you said that was on the heels of one of the coldest winters. <laughs> Yeah, I should see. Yeah, but this is the middle of April, so most of the winter was past. Yeah. I thought it was awful cold, but <laughs> well, because it only had a house about sixty all winter, and the same way at the other home, that's about the way we heat our house in the winter is about sixty, sixty-five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what what were you telling me here this morning about the the one lady who was making the salad? <laughs> Tell me that. You, you don't want that on. I do. What? No, I'm, well, I'm uh, no. About what? Betty Randall. Oh. She was making salad and her nose was running and dripped in the salad. No, I, I don't want that. <laughs> Why not? I was just telling him kind of laughing. And Fred Dodson was telling me about it. He said, you can bet I didn't eat any salad that night. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But Betty was just as happy. She didn't know her nose dripped in the salad. <laughs> <laughs> She wasn't the normal cook. She only cooked on weekends. Yeah. What was it that you used to do the do to the cat at Drewstown? Well, only one thing. Uh, and the old cat was sleeping next to the water heater. And I had a pair of scissors, and I don't know why, but I reached over and just cut the whiskers off one side of her face. And if that, she didn't look ridiculous. You think you wouldn't notice that? And I don't think the cat ever did notice it. But I, I laughed and went in and told Aunt Martha, who was cooking that day, I said, you know, somebody cut the whiskers off a cat on one side. Well, she, who, who would do a thing like that? <laughs> so you never fessed up? I never fessed Oh, no. <laughs> she didn't know the day she died. Yeah. Well, yeah. we got to heaven, she might have And she lived out. over be a hundred over in Canada, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a dear old soul. Yeah, she was. Very, huh. very helpful and very good. Mm -hmm. So what are, your, some, what are some of your fondest memories of, of Drewstown in Ireland? What was adopting Trevor? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Tell me about how Trevor kind of came into your guys' life and and how you kind of made the decision to <laughs> grow closer towards well, him. Well, we were working in an orphanage. You were working in Avoca at the time. At Avoca. That's where you met Trevor. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we met him in Dublin, but okay. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, I'm not going to agree on that now. It's, it's, uh, but I will say we went up in the van and got him and brought him home. Right. And she held him on her lap all the way down. Hmm. A little boy, about five weeks old. Yeah. And she said, you know, I just feel like I've just given birth. I did. I just felt weak. And he was, he was, he was like, hours from the word go. Yeah. And I was holding him in my arms the whole way home. Yeah. It's just like he it. was a good baby, like, like Finn is. Yeah. Didn't cry much. Mm -mm. Um, only when he was real hungry, I guess. And of course, all the other kids, they, he was something new, you know. And yeah. they all later on wanted to hold him and feed him and all that kind of thing. But yeah, so uh, we picked him up in Dublin. So, and then what? At what age did you adopt him? Well. <clears throat> We weren't thinking, in fact, that was kind of against mission rules. You just didn't adopt kids. Yeah. There's so many, and you're showing favoritism, I suppose. Right. Anyway, um, we had Trevor for, whew. well, we left the Kilmo on furlough and left him with one of the ladies, uh, John Griswold's wife. Were they married yet? I don't know. Uh, what was her name? I can picture her. Anyway, Trevor would have been maybe a year and a bit, not much more than a year. About two or something. It was hard to say goodbye to that oh, guy. Oh, that was the hardest thing. I was just miserable in fact, the whole it, it, time over here. Here's kind of an interesting story. We got on the plane and we were in the air and Ruth was crying and Nathan said, what's the matter, mommy? Are you crying because we had to leave Trevor? And she said, yeah. And Nathan was crying too. He said, I am too. And he cried and cried. So just <laughs> probably a year and a half. Trevor worked his way into our family. Anyway, <clears throat> we got back, and uh, then at that point, Northern Ireland and, this, and the IRA were, it was getting bloody. I mean, they were killing people. Yeah. And there was talk of civil war between Northern Ireland, the six, six counties, against the 26 counties in the south and of course England it would have been a, a, a hopeless situation for Ireland because England with all her her might and power and troops <laughs> anyway the kids must have heard that talk about civil war because we knew that if civil war broke out we would be uh, pulled out and sent back to America and they must have heard that. Anyway, they said, sir, sir, the girl particularly, why don't you adopt Trevor? Well, we hadn't thought much about it because well, he, he was unadoptable. But politically, it was kind of a, a dicey situation anyway. So, but we were in the car one day, and we had twins, Susan and Leslie, and we were going into town, and they said, why don't you adopt Trevor? He needs you. Well, the point was, they figured they could take care of themselves, all of those kids, <laughs> but maybe Trevor couldn't. Yeah, because they were 12, 13 by that time. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> we began experimenting and found out that Trevor was not adoptable. Right, because of the law. Uh, well, Is yes. Because you're a Protestant, right? No, because <clears throat> his mother wouldn't, wouldn't give him up. I guess that was it. Okay. 
She know. had to. She had to anyway. And uh, the the two. Anyway, we tried and found out that that was the situation. So we um, in between we had brought him to America when we were on furlough. We were we were felt so bad with him the first time we had to leave him, and so the next time we got permission from his mother if they. He could leave the country with us yeah. as his guardians. Yeah. <clears throat> By that time, he would have been five yeah. or maybe six. We, we landed in Cedar Rapids Airport. Dad and Mom met us, brought us home, arrived at Dad's house. About well, evening, let's say six o'clock. And the clouds and the lightning yeah. and thunder. Trevor had a hold of my, my finger, just one, yeah. <laughs> like that. And my hand on that. And he said, I'm not scared, Daddy. I'm not scared. Oh, I'm not scared. Because he wanted to stay. He pretty obviously was scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was. He was shaking. But off. anyway, yeah. so did we take him with us on deputation to the West Coast? You know, I can't remember that. I don't either. Anyway, we had started adoption proceedings. And then found out that um, the law said Catholic children must be adopted by Catholic parents. Right. Protestant children must be adopted by Protestant parents. And, and his birth mom was Protestant. So when we were filling out papers, uh, there was a caseworker who was, who was uh, helping us. And she wanted to see Trevor adopted. But when we were filling out papers, here, what's your denomination? And I said, non denominational. And she read that and she said, ah, oh, I was afraid you'd say something like that. I said, what? What's wrong with that? Well, Catholics by Catholic parents. Protestant, okay. But then they named seven Protestant denominations Church of Ireland, Methodist, Baptist. Presbyterian, even uh, Salvation Army, and something else. I don't remember what it was. And I said, you know, that, that didn't seem right to me because suppose we were Nazarene, Nazarenes or Pentecostal or something else. I said, you know, we can't adopt. And she said, well, look, would you write your, your thoughts and reasons on a piece of paper so I can turn it into my superiors? I said, okay. So I sat down and spelled it out that a pretty good segment of Irish society can adopt. Yeah. We came home on furlough, went back. And I, I remember writing a letter to this caseworker, and I said, we're back in, in Ireland again. And I said, I don't suppose there's anything we can salvage from our efforts, but here we are. And she wrote right back, she said, yes, she said, the law has been changed and you can move ahead with your, with your uh, adoption. Hmm. So. Because of Trevor and us, the the adoption laws of Ireland were changed. So they just God used us uh, to change the laws of the nation. And when we went in that day, they talked to us, and then they said to Trevor, "Do you want to be adopted?" He said, "Oh yes, I do. <laughs> I could just bury me at all right." By that time he had a bit of an American accent, but. And, and we had to meet with a panel of the adoption panel, which yeah. included lawyers and a judge, and I don't know who else. But, but they were all in favor of it. They could see that and we Trevor were, knew what it was all about too. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what? Uh, what other 
fond memories do you have of Voca or Drewstown or Ireland? That do you have oh. any funny stories or or anything of the such? Well, here's the funny thing. <coughs> John Bailey was by, by whatever time it was was uh, in his last year of Drewstown school. And he was a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, teenagers, you know, begin to feel their oats oh, and independence. And I remember one winter day when all the students were coming back from a three-week, three-day three, uh, three day Christmas break. Not Christmas, but long weekend, they called it. And it was dark. But still a bit snowing, and I I knew John was up to some kind of trouble, and he went out the laundry door, and I just started to follow him, and he came around the, the front of the house, to the front of the house, and he happened to look back, and I'm following, him. about like from from here to <laughs> to his baggy stuff there. And John never said a word. I didn't say a word. He just went back in the house, and, and I did too. <laughs> and but I say he was a bit of a problem. <clears throat> so, but we we got him a job up in the north of Ireland. Yeah. And he got saved. He hadn't been saved before that. And got acquainted with a couple of young Christians who were playing guitars on the street corner and witnessing, and John started doing the same thing. And so, there's no doubt about his salvation at this point. And then he wanted to find his birth mother. Well, we had a little bit of information, such as his birth certificate, which showed that his mother lived at that point in uh, in the south. I didn't oh, know he was here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No hold up? Yeah, up fairly close to to the border. I don't remember the town. Anyway, <laughs> he's not afraid of being dropped apparently. No. So <clears throat> I, I gave John the information <laughs> and uh, he phoned I guess, or yeah, he phoned the uh, the name in the book, telephone book. Yeah. And the lady who answered was the first cousin of, I think her name was Mary, John's mother. And they said, oh, she wasn't, she wasn't living there. She's over in England now. Yeah. So. He got in contact. No, she had been in England, but the cousin didn't know she was back. But she was living in Belfast on the same street that John Bailey was living, just down the road, maybe a half a mile. Wow. So they met, got in contact. Small world. Small world. <laughs> So here we have pictured Finn Skiff's dad, the youngest, mem newest member of the family, and and we have the oldest members of the family, all in the same. I guess so. <laughs> He's not concerned as long as they feed him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> those toes would grip anything that. They can't get a hold of. <laughs> that amuses me. He's gripping pretty tight with those toes. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why did he uh, grip so tight? The, the end of these, these two fingers are white. Or two toes. See how white they are? He's gripping that hard. <laughs> yeah, quite a man. <laughs> Uh, Paul, you know Paul. You want to hear about Paul Montgomery? Yeah, sure. 
Well, Paul was kind of a quiet lad in school, but he finished school, bad eyesight. Yeah. And the doctor was when he was a kid, we had him in a vocal manner, so, so we knew him from the age of eight. And the doctors had said that he'd be totally blind by age 20. But he kept enough eyesight to go to Drewstown School, which is the same as high school, and graduated and got a job in Dublin working in a, in a toy importer store. Uh -huh. And the owner uh, got pretty fond of Paul because he knew that some of the kids were stealing from him, stealing stock. And he wanted Paul to kind of keep track of him. I don't know if he ever squealed on or found out anybody. But Paul worked there about two or three years and lived in a big boarding house with other boys, apprentice boys, and then decided that or he felt the Lord calling him to Bible school. And he said something to the boss. He said, I, I think the Lord wants me in Bible college. And the boy, boss probably wasn't very interested in that. He wanted to keep Paul because he could trust him. Yeah. But Paul, anyway, finally resigned and got a, accepted at Prairie Bible College in Alberta, Canada. All the way from Ireland to Alberta, Canada. He did four years there. And we sent him a little money once or twice, but not very much. He just so kind of worked his way through that. school. <laughs> and then, because he was a foreign student on a student visa, they said, well, you know, you've got so many days to get out of the country unless you continue your education. So Perry staff made him a staff member at, in a, pain, a painting apprenticeship. Yeah. So he spent four years with that. So he, now he's, a, he's not only a Bible college graduate, but he, he's a journeyman painter. And then he met Joyce sometime in that time. And uh, <clears throat> so they got married and came back down to the United States in Minnesota where Joyce's, no, I, her family was further north. Anyway, St. Paul, Minnesota, where they ended up. In St. Paul, Minnesota? Yeah. <clears throat> and he started his own painting business. Yeah. And one year they decided to, to go with uh, CEF Child Fellowship, CEF Child Evangelism Fellowship, and went to Switzerland and worked all summer long, free of charge, painting, glazing of some windows and stuff, huh, in an old castle-like thing that CEF owned. Came back and wanted to stop in Ireland just to visit some old friends, you know. And uh, one day Joyce, before they, they got ready to leave, Joyce said, let's see if we can find your roots. Uh, your parents, uh, uh, Paul, uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy. With my, with my, with my, the ones who reared me, Ruth and I. And Joey said, let's, let's, let's try. You so you he went down to, to Dublin from Drewstown and down to the, uh, someplace on the key, Bureau of Vital, Vital Statistics. Uh -huh. And within minutes, he, he had his birth certificate. His birth certificate. His mother was Mary Montgomery, and she lived at such and such a place in Donegal. And jo Joy said, let's go. And so they rented the a car and drove clear over to Donegal. Donegal was a city, oh, how many thousand people? I don't know, probably 20 or 30,000. Pretty good size. It was kind of seat. And all the rest of the day, they looked, asked. Nobody knew that address. Nobody. Nobody. So finally they gave it up 
and we're starting to leave. It was evening, mm -hmm. and uh, it was raining, misty kind of an evening. And they're really ex more exiting the city. And Joy said, Paul, Paul, stop, stop. She, what, what, what is, she said, see those two old men on the corner of the, the street there? Maybe they'd know. So Paul stopped the car, backed up, and said, do you know that we're going to find this address? And one of the guys looked at it and he said, well, that's not a street address. He said, that's a district. No wonder nobody knows knows about it. Yeah. And he said, well, why were you, are you, who are you looking for? Well, Paul said, my mother was here when I was born here. And then she left me in Dublin in an orphanage. What was her name? Well, Mary Montgomery. And the guy said, you know. He said, step back here a couple of steps. See no, that? You're getting ahead of the story. Oh, am I? He said that. Oh, yeah. My, my mother was a midwife who traveled all over the city when a young a woman was giving birth. That's what mo most babies were born at home. And he said, uh, I had a car. And he said, I often drove my mother to different homes where babies were being born. He said, I remember driving my mother to your, to Mary's home the day you were born. <laughs> Paul said, is she still living? He said, you see that little cafe down there in the corner? Yeah. Well, she works there. <laughs> yeah. And this is a city lots bigger than Burlington. So they backed up, went in. Is Mary Montgomery here? No, she's not here today. She had to go to a funeral. Mm -hmm. But she'll be here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So they got bed and breakfast and went in the next morning. And oh, man, the old man said, you, You'll know who she is because she's blonde and she lives a bit. Paul was telling me this. He said, we went in the next morning and there were four waitresses and they were all blonde <laughs> and they all limped. Yeah, yeah. So, so he said, one of them came to the table and, what do you want? Well, I'd like to talk to Mary Montgomery. Well, that's her over there. I'll send her over. So she came over. Yeah, Paul said, you would recognize me, but I'm your son, Paul. Can you imagine a, a jolt like that? So the whole story unfolded, and, and I, I don't need to go into detail about that, but, but Mary did later, she quite a lot of years later, oh, she said, would you like to meet my family? Well, of course Paul would. That's what he was out there for, <laughs> Paul and Joy, so. So she, they, they lived on a little farm outside, outside town, and there were two two boys, and two girls I think, or three girls, two girls, for sure. And the two boys come to find out, Mary after Paul was born, she was in Dublin with the baby, like him, but he was he was kind of a sickly baby. And. Uh, she finally knew that she couldn't take care of him the way he needed and, and work a job to support him. So she placed him in an orphanage temporarily and went back to Donegal. And in Donegal, she became, um, her sister, I think, had married a guy And then she died, and left him left him with two boys. And Mary moved into that situation, didn't marry the guy. I don't think they ever did, but but she kind of reared the other two boys. Mm -hmm. And no, then she did get married because she had two of her own girls. Yeah. And one of the boys said to Paul the next day, he said, "You know, I, I feel awful." that your mom put you in, in an orphanage and then reared my brother and me. And Paul said, 
you don't need to feel sorry for me. He said, I, I was reared by, by some people who loved me and, and gave me, he said, I'm, I'm a university gra college graduate and I got a good job and a wife and at least, I think, two children by that time. So, <laughs> almost the end of the story. Yes. So, I think we've heard, uh, we've heard about the war, we've heard about some childhood, we've heard about Ireland. Um, you know, we're going to have this video for years to come, and I'm sure many people are, uh, will find joy in hearing some of your stories. But if there's one, if there's one thing that you would just kind of like to leave it with, if, you know, speak, speaking to the current generation and the generations to come, you know, speaking to Finn, who's on grandma's lap, you know, <laughs> what's kind of one thought you'd like to leave, leave us with? Well, there's a lot we could say we're thankful for, but one thought that permeated our lives for a long time is that God is in control and he's led us in ways that we never could have imagined and still is. The Bible says our times are in his hands. That is our years, our months, our days. And he knew the day that I was going to be born and Ruth too. He led us together, God did. And he gave us the family we have and our great grandsons. And, uh, so we, we trust him completely. So do I fear the coming evil days that the, that the uh, uh, Solomon wrote about? He called them evil days. The evil, uh, the evil days come uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 anyway. No, I don't fear those. I don't fear... Eternity's got to be so much better than this. And, and I'm limited now. i still got this cane. And I use it because I'm not too steady on my pins anymore. And my leg hurts a lot. But uh, that's all in God's plan, too. I mean, he, he could have kept my, my leg from going uh, bad. So, I, I'm, we're confident in God's care and provision. He's kept us together for 72 years, not very far off from 73. Yep. And certainly we're going to trust him for the rest of this little short time that we'll still be here on earth. And just a few days ago, our... Uh, Great granddaughter was here, she's seven, and she told us that she had just asked Jesus into her heart and that they were starting to read the book of John now, and that was wonderful news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's Jim's granddaughter. Oh, yeah. Regrets? I don't have any, maybe I should have. We. We uh, expected to stay on the farm, this farm right here. Yeah. I love the work, and it was successful up to a point, but God began to lead us away. And um, his leading was pretty sure, and the years that have come since then have proved that his, his pathway for us was right. You wouldn't be here today, Niall, if we had stayed on the farm, see, because we went over to Ireland and <laughs> our son met your mom. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't thank me, thank the Lord. <laughs> yeah. But so many uh, things like that mm -hmm. uh, have proved mm -hmm. his. Have I been mm -hmm. as successful a worker mm -hmm. in God's vineyard? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. I could have been much more successful. 
but we do what we do what we can. <laughs> Yeah. So God has so ordained humanity and life that we all won't pass off the scene and we we leave things in the hands of somebody like that. Yeah. And you, Niall. He might like to Santa. be laid down now, huh? And here again we're seeing God leading. Where why how else? Would now found a girl from Denmark. I know. That's yeah. uh, got gotta be God leading, you know. Yeah. I guess so. But it's the one that you and I used to sing together, and we sang it to the Olsen kids, grandkids. Precious, hmm? precious Olsen, no. Um, uh, yeah, but I don't remember what it was. Faith Olsen, precious Olsen, and... Yeah, but I don't remember what the song was. The Crayon Box. Hmm, I forgot that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it goes anymore. I don't know. I can't think of that one. I can't think how it goes. Mm -hmm. I remember how they always wanted that song, yeah? I have no idea. Yeah. It'll come to me in a minute. for the Christian. I've forgotten that. that. I'm sorry, I forgot that. I liked all of that. And then here's one that, uh, Santa, you'll need to learn. <laughs> uh, A Bobby Turnip nose? A tiny turnip nose, yeah, oh, it's it. just like a rose to sweet from head to toes, that little child of mine. <laughs> Two eyes that look so Two bright. Two eyes that shine so bright. Two, Two arms that hold me tight. Two lips that kiss goodnight. That, that little, little boy child boy or girl. No one will ever know just what his coming has meant. Because, because I, I love, love him so, him so. He's, he's something, something heaven has sent. He's, He's all, all the world, world to me. me. He, he climbs, climbs up on my, my knee. knee. I know he'll always be that little boy of mine. I used to say that each one of that, our kids that song. <laughs> I forgot. We taught that to Andrea, uh, to Andrea, but I don't think she used it. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that. How's the tune go? A tiny turned up nose. anymore. I used to go to national music contests, but not anymore. <laughs> I don't sing. Two 
arms that hold me tight, to the lips that kiss me tonight. I know he loves me. Okay. Just what his coming has meant. Because I love him so. Sunday school was the hour before that, yeah. before I was, I was needed. So I, I threw the harmonica in my pocket, and I pulled it out and started down the hallway, down the basement, to our Sunday school room, and I was doing... Another lady came out of the, her Sunday school room. She said, What's going on? <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 it's obvious I need to practice more. Give us, a, give us another tune, one of your favorites. One what? Give us one of your favorite tunes. <laughs> 